Okay, so the transition in evolution in evolutionary terms between fish and the first amphibians includes actually a, a pretty good number of species that we know about. In other words, we actually have skeletons and, and fossils of a, a, actually a pretty good number of species that we believe represent the, um, the transition between fish and tetrapods. And one of the species that was really a key discovery, um, and this, this fossil was discovered by a guy named Neil Shubin. And Neil Shubin, you will get to know later on in the course. There will be uh, a little assigned activity coming up later on. But in any case, um, the fossil that they found that represents a really critical um, connection between the transition between fish and tetrapods is called Tiktaalik. And Tiktaalik, they, this is an artist rendition of what it might have looked like. It was more fish than tetrapod. And um, there's another guy named Ichthyostega, which is a little more tetrapod than fish. But anyway, there's a series of intermediate species. But this is Tiktaalik. And Tiktaalik, if you notice, he still has the lobe fins, but there is a significant change to the head structures. So the eyes got more, uh, got closer together and more on the top surface than on the side of the head. And the head itself flattened out in Tiktaalik, as far as we can tell from the fossils. The tail, though, is still a fish tail. And so it's very much um, an intermediate species. So I will have a little project where you're going to look into Tiktaalik and that discovery a little bit more later on. For now, we're going to look at the amphibians. Salamanders, this guy looks pretty familiar. This is um, the, uh, you remember the salamanders from California. So salamanders are four-legged amphibians. They have a tail. Frogs. Frogs belong to a group called Aenura, which means no tail. So they form a tail. They have the postanal tail as tadpoles, but then the tail disappears during metamorphosis into the adult. And then you have something called Sicilians, which um, are legless. So it's, it's really interesting how evolution moves from a fish that has no legs to a four-legged um, tetrapod and then once the animals had four legs one of the groups immediately not immediately but over millions of years loses the legs again so it's sometimes called a reversal although it's not really a reversal it's just another change um, that happened so the features that distinguish amphibians from their fish um, predecessors would be legs and lungs Cutaneous respiration. So amphibians can breathe quite a bit through their skin. Their skin stays moist. All respiratory surfaces need to have large amounts of surface area and they need to be moist. And the skin, for, the, for a lot of the amphibians anyway, works um, for that. They do have lungs though, but the lungs are not extremely developed. I don't mean developed, they're not extremely complex. They're more like a sack and they don't have as much surface area as, say, reptile lungs or mammal lungs. The first appearance of pulmonary veins creates a second circuit. And what we mean is the fish only have a single circuit of blood flow. It, blo throw, blo excuse me, it flows through the heart, then goes over the gills to pick up oxygen, and then it goes to the rest of the body and then returns back to the heart. So a single circuit. For the amphibians, you see the, a second circuit. So the blood goes to the heart, then out to the lungs, then back to the heart, and then out to the body. So there's two circuits. One circuit that goes from the lungs to the heart, excuse me, from the heart to the lungs to the heart, and one that goes from the 
heart to the body, back to the heart. So let me make a drawing. Nope. Drawing control P gives me my pen. So you can think of it kind of like a figure eight in a way where the, the heart is at the intersection. And our circulation works this way as well. So blood goes from the heart to the lungs. So this is going to be lungs and then back to the heart. And then it goes from the heart out to the body, which we call the system. I don't know why it does that system and then back to the heart. And it keeps alternating heart, lungs, heart, system, heart, lungs, heart, system. And um, that's the what we call the pulmonary circuit. Pulmonary refers to the lungs. So if you have some kind of pulmonary problem, it involves the lungs. And they have a ventricle that has some division in it. So they have a three chambered heart with a partially divided ventricle. So that's going to carry over into the reptiles as well. You may be aware that when fertilized frog eggs hatch, they are tadpoles like a fish. And then that metamorphoses into the frog. The tadpole breathes with gills. The frog has lungs. The, the, um, the lungs, though, come from a different structure than the gills. So gills just disappear, lungs uh, up here. Now moving from the amphibians, amphibians have to go back to water to lay their eggs. Like a fish, um, they have to lay their eggs in water. You may have seen fish, egg, or fish eggs and um, frog eggs, for example. They're in the water. They're very gelatinous. They're very um, small, little sticky guys. The evolution with one group of the amphibians evolved what's called the amniote egg. The amniote egg is an egg that has several layers of membranes and usually a shell of some type. Some shells are uh, kind of fragile. Some are more leathery, but some kind of shell. And these these membranes, one of them called the amnion, and you've probably heard of amniotic fluid. So some of these, these special membranes, all of this makes up the amniote egg. So this allowed this group of animals to not have to go back to water in order to reproduce. They can lay their eggs right there on land. The eggs will hatch on land and you don't have to go back to the water um, for this. Okay, so it, at this point in the amniotes, there's a split. There's actually three kinds of amniotes, all right? The anapsid, the synapsid, and the diapsids. And the easiest way to tell them apart is the skull. How many um, temporal fenestrae are in the skull, the holes? So the anapsids just have the eye socket. The synapsids have the eye socket and then a second opening here. And then the diapsids have three openings in the skull. All right. Um, so other than the eye socket, we say synapsids have one, diapsids have two but that's when you're eliminating the, the eye socket. Is, that doesn't count. But anyway, so we are synapsids. So, so the um, amniotes as a ancestral group, so there was some kind of ancestral amniote, and then it splits. Oops, I don't know why it keeps doing that. Okay, so this is the split. Synapsids and diapsids. Diapsids are reptiles. Synapsids are mammals. Right. So when you, this is the ancestral amniote, all right, we said the synapsids go to the mammals, the diapsids with a little bit of, uh, there's this extinct anapsids, you don't have to worry about that, go over here, and these are all the reptiles. So 
all the reptiles here. Now, what of these do you recognize? Uh, we're not going to go into these other divisions. So diapsids and synapsids are the two. So the ones I've circled are the ones you need to know. Now, within the diapsids, do you know what normal, uh, what typical reptiles are? You know, lizards and snakes, crocodiles and alligators, turtles, and then the birds. So the birds evolved from a particular group of the dinosaurs. And um, we looked, we talked a little bit about this um, when we talked about what good is half a wing, because you remember that the birds evolved from theropod dinosaurs. All right, so, but anyway, so snakes, turtles, lizards, crocodiles, those kinds of things, and then birds. All right, so what are the characteristics of the reptiles? The amniotic egg, dry skin with scales, and then thoracic breathing, meaning the lungs are connected to the ribs in a way that you can, the um, animal can move, contract the muscles uh, in the ribs and expand and contract that lung capacity. All right, so that's different because frogs don't breathe that way. Frogs, when they do use their lungs, they actually swallow the air in their mouth and they force it down into the lungs. So they have to swallow the air. They fill up their mouth and they close their lips and then they force it back into the lungs. But the reptiles have the contraction of the chest muscles, which is a little bit different way of breathing. And that's more similar to the way we breathe, although mammals also have another trick for breathing and it's called the diaphragm. Reptiles don't have a diaphragm. And most reptiles are ectothermic. They regulate their body temperature in the environment by where they are. They move into warmer or cooler places and their body temperature matches that. Sometimes we call that cold-blooded, although it's that's a little misleading because reptile bodies could be warm as warm or warmer than your body if they're in the sun, but at other times they're cold. So they can be cold and they can be quite warm, um, but that's we're gonna stick with the term ectothermic. Cold-blooded is a little bit of a, more of a slang. And so because of this, reptiles can't live in really cold regions like the Arctic. So in the Arctic, you're not gonna see reptiles, um, but otherwise they're in uh, pretty much every habitat in the Antarctic, so to speak. All right, so here's just some pictures. Turtle. The sulcata um, turtles, these guys are amazing. They're huge, and they can knock over a brick wall. Um, they, can, they can really cause some destruction. I don't know how they, in a zoo, how they keep them enclosed, but crocodilians, so crocodile. And then the birds. So one of the um, transitional species between reptiles and birds is called Archaeopteryx. When you see this P-T-E-R, it means wings. So I don't know if you remember. Do you remember Coleoptera is the, refers to the beetles? Beetles have wings. So anytime you see this P-T-E-R, it means wings. In this case, this means ancient wings or something like that, um, but it refers to a particular species, a particular extinct species that is the transition between the dinosaurs, one of the transitional species between the dinosaurs and modern birds. And birds have a lot of ad adaptations for flight, not just their wings, but also their bones, which are hollow to make them lighter. And they have less organs, like they don't have two of everything in general because, or two of some organs because it's just too much weight. So they have, in some cases, just one um, organ of different types. They have a special breathing system for flight. Unfortunately, a lot of the birds went extinct in the Cretaceous extinction, so at the end of the Mesozoic. 
but not all of them. All right, now we get to the mammals. I'm going to start the mammal um, lecture in a different segment.